joining me here on this vegan plant-based summit. How are you today? Oh, I'm doing fine. And it's my pleasure to be a part of this exciting stuff you guys are doing. So. Okay, so thanks very much for being part of it. Now, you've got a really varied upbringing. I guess you could call it eclectic. <laughs> <laughs> so you've got a different story to tell to most of the um, people on the summit. Tell us where your journey started. What was your background? Okay, so uh, my dad was in the Coast Guard, so we did move a bit. And uh, I my developmental years were spent in Hawaii, which really shaped my life quite a bit, I think. And then moving to California, uh, I got a degree in physics. I was going in a totally different direction. I did engineering for a couple of years. I just, you know, it, it never really grabbed me. And every, every day was drudgery. And I had always kind of wanted to be a filmmaker. So around, I guess I was 27, I jumped into filmmaking with my former lab partner in physics. And we've been doing that ever since. And I mean, since then, uh, God, I've had such a diverse uh, portfolio. We went to, we did a, a complete disaster of a film, absolute disaster of a film on me running a great wall marathon in China. The marathon was the easy part. Actually putting together a story from it was the difficult part. And that actually, that taught me a great deal about story and what's actually lacking in, um, in modern filmmaking, I think a lot of the time is that element of story. And uh, since then, though, I've got I've it's been kind of like an Indiana Jones existence. I went to I lived in Libya during and after the revolution for a little over a year and finished my film Strong in the Bullets, which is on a big music revolution that happened in Libya that nobody saw. I mean, it was complete. I think CNN did one report on it, but it was completely under the radar. And it was this just massive, exciting music revolution. So much exciting stuff was going on in Libya. And then since then, uh, I crossed the empty quarter with uh, the first women to ever cross the empty quarter in an expedition, two Omani women and an English woman. And also we were working on a film on a general who's fighting the jihadists in Niger, but using peace. So it's kind of flipping the, the image of the African general on his head. And so how I started working toward veganism, I was, I mean, looking back, I don't think I really was that much of a meat eater to begin with. I mean, I, I would eat it, but uh, I didn't, it never really, it's not something I always thought was a necessity in my life. So as an adult, I'd go weeks without eating any meat, without even thinking about it. It's hard to really identify a turning point, but I know when I totally stopped eating meat was after I had back surgery or neck surgery. My doctor actually strongly suggested in the recovery period not to eat meat. And I said, I was always one, uh, one foot in the door or one foot in the door already i might as well and that was early 2017 and then since then really had no desire for me i've there have been situations in different countries where you, you kind of have to but other than that you know i'm just i have no desire to eat meat so you've traveled to a lot of different countries where they have very very different cultures to us as a vegan, how have you actually dealt with that? Uh, usually I deal with it by accepting the food. And the reason being, um, I guess I could justify it a number of ways. One of them, I had an experience with a, a friend of mine who was, she acted in a way that I decided I was not going to be. And this was right when I, when I started veganism in, in 2017, we were in Morocco and people were serving her food. She said, oh, no, I'm not going to eat that. I'm a vegetarian. And I just I said, I, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I can't. Because you, you have to take into consideration, like places like Niger, too, when you're with the Tuareg, they don't have that much food. And then they're I'm offering you, you know, your hospitality, their hospitality. They're going out of their way for you. It's, 
uh, I think a bit um, disrespectful just to turn down the food, say, Oh no, I'm a, I'm, I'm a vegan. You know, I, that always, I could never do that. So. In the West, we have so much of everything. We seem to forget how little other parts of the world have. What's the most remote place have you been to and how have people received you? Hospitality wise, of course. And the most remote place I've been was in the empty quarter in the Arabian desert where there, you know, we, it was lizards that were giving us hospitality. So, uh, but in, in Niger on the Burkina Faso border, uh, like a place called Banquila Ray, we, uh, there were a lot of um, Tuareg and Fulani and, and they were, I mean, they served us millet, which I fell in love with how they served them. I mean, the millet there is amazing. And it just is a second nature to the Tuareg too. The, I mean, hospitality, no matter what they have, you know, what they have or don't have, it's just a, you know, a thing that's required in the culture. And so to not accept the hospitality would be a major insult. So, Going from there back to Libya, it was a war zone. It, you know, you, you have reported about the underground music scene, but what, what were people doing for food? What was the culture like during this war? It's very meat-based. I mean, Libyan food, you really can't get away from that at all. I mean, even the... They have stuffed vegetables. The vegetables are stuffed with meat. So... But then I wasn't a vegetarian, so I didn't even really think about it. So it was just a different mindset. I mean, now it would be a little more difficult for me. But back then, yeah, it just it wasn't really a consideration. And I guess when we're talking about mindset, we can apply mindset ac across everything. When you've been traveling around the globe, how have you seen a difference in the attitude towards animal welfare, towards veganism and towards the environment? That, that really depends. But in places like Niger, when you're dealing with the Tuareg, they don't have industrial farming. And even more uh, with regards to the, you know, the ethics of killing, uh, the industrial farming is an ecosystem disaster waiting to happen. And it's already proven to be disastrous. And we're in the middle of a pandemic and industrial farming is just a time bomb on top of that. But you go to places like uh, Niger with the Tuareg and the Fulani that they, you know, they don't have thousands of cows or chickens stacked together. You know, they have their herd of uh, six cows or five camels and the herd, they wander across a large, a large um, range of land. It's a totally different life for the animals. It's more like, it's the difference between Northern California and places in Southern California. In Northern California, you see the cattle on vast fields, you know, grazing. But in Southern California, like in the Imperial Valley, you see them all, like the milk cows, just all pushed together in these little stalls that they can't move. They just, they just stand there. And besides that being an ecosystem disaster, I mean, what kind of life is that, you know? Yeah. I mean, it, at least with a camel gets to wander a large range of land. In, in the West, we, well, vegans don't obviously, but industry sees animals as a commodity. What are your experiences on how people treat animals in other parts of the world? It's varied. Very, uh, but I know the Omanis, for instance, that I think a lot of the time they appreciate camels more than people. Because knowing, I, I think I, I mentioned to you before that, you know, that saying that a, at least a, you know if a camel hates you. And the Fulani in Niger, I mean, they've, they worship their cows. They treat their cows better than each other, practically. And then in places like India, where you see the you know, monkeys revered, that they're all over the temples, and cows just in Baranasi, just doing whatever they want to do. It's, but it's, it, is, it is varied. I mean, 
in in Niger, there are people known for mistreating their camels. You know, it really depends on the person. But I think overall, just because you're dealing with much such a less uh, less dense amount, you're just dealing with so many so many fewer animals, and there's really no tradition in, in like Niger of just bunch them together. I mean, you go to places in Asia and you see that. You see, you know, the the classic in Vietnam, you know, the the lady and her whole family on the, the moped, and then they've got a big bundle of chickens just shoved in a cage, which is, uh, you know, you look at it and look at it horror, but is it any worse than what we see here in the industrial farms? So, no. Um, talking about the industrial farms, you, you live in California, as you've said, and in the north of America, these farms are absolutely huge. What effect does that have on the environment and also the people that live there? Well, I think uh, it's, it's very relevant right now because spillover is such a major danger. And uh, I was reading about Lyme disease and how the how Lyme disease was able to really get a hold is not in these vast tracts of forest. It's in these little suburban forests because the lack of diversity. When you have no diversity, the the mice and the, the ticks have a very um, they have a complete open range to proliferate. And so that's what we're seeing and with the slash and burn tactics in the Amazon. I mean, all over the world we're having this problem and we're going right up against adjacent to these areas. And you've got bats that are well known for because their immune system hosts to all types of infections and you're just asking for spillover. So when I hear people complain about the wet markets, I, I, I just keep on thinking, look in your own backyard, man. <laughs> we're sitting on a time bomb ourselves. And I hope COVID opens people's eyes to that, that, I mean, a big culprit, now and in the future is not a, is a is a lot of types of ecosystem collapse but the industrial farming is an absolutely massive problem and uh, here in california our water issues the cattle they're a huge problem for our water issues because of all the water that the pastoral land needs now i, I believe water is at the point where it could become scarce in California and very soon. What impact do you think that's going to have, not only on the animals and the land, but the people? It's already had an impact because, for one, the citizens get blamed by the industrial farming for wasting all the water when they're wasting 85 or 80 to 85 percent of the water. They also blame the golf courses, which have very low impact because they recycle all their water now. And, but they are the culprits, the ranchers and the farmers. And their lobby is so big, you know, and you see signs everywhere acting like these, you know, they're these little farming families. No, but guys like Resnick are billionaires. And the almond farming industry is massive. I mean, absolutely massive. And it takes up so much water. Or the date farming in, in Southern California takes up a huge amount of water. And we've got to start asking the serious questions. Are these crops worth it? Are the, I mean, because we as a citizens are going to pay the brunt of it. We're the ones that are going to have to ration. And these guys are just going to put more money into lawyers and lobbying. As vegans, plant-based vegans, we have a bit of a problem, really, because on one hand, we don't want these huge factory farms with animals. But then we have the media telling us that don't eat the almonds, don't drink almond milk, don't eat the avocados, don't eat the dates because they're the ones taking all the water. I mean, what's your perspective on this? What would you suggest? There are always other solutions. I mean, farming is not bad. Farming is absolutely necessary, but you know, we've got to start putting, I mean, Guys like Resnick could invest money into recycling water. And I think now they have to. It's only the last few years California is starting to clamp down on them. I mean, look at this. The Economist, you know, which is a very centrist type of pro-business uh, neoliberal magazine, 
they had a series of articles on how bad the industrial farming is in California with regards to water. And that should be telling you something, you know, and, and you know, the, but there are, there's, there's plenty of crops you can, I mean, there's California grows all sorts of vegetables and some are better than others. Almonds take up a huge amount of water. I mean, just a massive amount of water and California personally, I don't think can afford it unless, un, unless the, the, they do a total revamping of the water system, the irrigation systems for the almonds, because it's just, it, it becomes unnecessary and it puts all the weight on the California citizens. And we're 40 million people now. That's a lot of people. Um, not quite as many people as cattle, but it's a lot of people. So when we talk about cattle and we're talking about almonds and dates and avocados and things, my mind automatically goes to the thought of deforestation and the Amazon. What's, what sort of views do you have on what's actually happening over there with the growing of soya and deforestation for cattle and soya purposes? Well, fun, you're, you're getting rid of one of the most important carbon traps or carbon dioxide traps by slashing this down. But in the near future, what you're doing too is you have these massive farms adjacent to these areas that have a lot of animals who've had very little contact with humans who could be carrying all sorts of novel viruses. And, and you know, you've heard it virtually every virologist and epidemiologist who isn't a, you know, a, a quack, you've heard almost all of them uh, screaming from the rooftops for the last 20, since SARS, that spillover is a massive threat. And I'm, I, I fully expect to see another pandemic in my lifetime. One that is potentially a lot worse than COVID, which was very bad. I mean, look what it completely disrupted the economy. It's killed half a million people in the United States. And imagine if that was just kind of a middle of the road pandemic. So we'd like to, in the West, we'd like to blame the wet markets for it. But if we look, as you say, in our own backyard, we need to be held accountable ourselves. And with deforestation, with the lack of water and the lack of education, um, there probably will be another pandemic, a worse one in our lifetime. If you could give the viewers at home some advice on what they can actually do to combat the situation that we're in at the moment, both animal-wise and environmentally, what would it be? Well, first, I mean, I look at it as with voting that you have most power locally. So you start with the policies locally. And for instance, I am very reluctant to have any almond products that are from California. And that's because of the, the billion dollar industry and the fact that I'm going to have to ration water in the future because of them. I mean, rationing is a good thing anyway. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's, you know, everything in moderation. However, when they're wasting tons and tons of water, I mean, ton, just a massive amounts of water. And we in the golf courses are getting all the blame for it. It's, you know, it's, it's like the whole recycling thing too. It's, it's an easy way for companies to put blame on the consumer. And the same thing is happening with water use here. And so, but I think that we have to start locally looking what we can do in our own, how, how we can change, like maybe don't buy so many Amazon boxes and just start from there. And, you know, it, because it, it, if you look at it on a global scale, it becomes impossible and it becomes daunting, and then you're most likely going to lose hope and just you know, say, well, what's the point? Well, start small and see how you can improve in your own little area. So your, your tip will be shop local, but not necessarily buy local, as in with the almonds, use common sense and try to buy sustainable products wherever you can. Yeah, everything you can to reduce your footprint. And that's 
that's going to be a constant struggle. I mean, for me, I'd like to think I reduce my footprint, but it's still a huge footprint. And there are a lot of things I, I can do. And it's all, it always seems daunting and impossible until it isn't, until it becomes, it's like when you start working out, you know, you have to really drag yourself. But if you do it every day and you don't miss a day, suddenly it's second nature. It's like going to sleep and you don't even think about it anymore. And it's the same. It's just a matter of deprogramming because a lot of the things that we're asking is just to be more efficient and you're actually wasting less energy to do it, to do certain things. You know, you know what I mean? But we, it's our programming of this uh, convenience lifestyle that actually sometimes teaches us that the inconvenient thing is the thing to do. So would you agree that going vegan, plant-based vegan, obviously, um, for health reasons, for animal welfare reasons, and for the environment is the number one best thing you could possibly do? It's certainly one of the best things you could do. I mean, I think if you do it um, with awareness, you're, you are going to reduce your footprint. I mean, if you jump into it and just do kind of the, you know, do it without any awareness, no, you probably will still have a pretty large footprint. But I think one thing I've learned with it is I like cooking a lot more. I've gotten a lot more clever on what I need to eat. I think a lot more about what I'm going to eat. And that is, I think, a very healthy thing instead of being on autopilot that, you know, that being a tertiary concern in your life. No, that should be your number one concern. I mean, is what you put in your body, getting enough water. That's when you're in the desert. That, that's a great example. When you strip down everything and you're on an expedition across a, you know, vast terrain of arid land that's nothing there. It totally strips that down. And you think about how much water I should be getting, uh, what I'm going to eat that night, if I'm going to get enough sleep, and everything else doesn't matter. And that's probably why I like doing stuff like that, because it strips down all the distractions that we think are important. When the most important thing is, is uh, keeping yourself healthy. I mean, and, but also, keeping the environment around you healthy too. And, and, and think in total terms of sustainability, not for yourself, but what you're giving to the environment around you. So we're, we're seeing a new wave of plant-based Gen Z people coming up and they have very, very different views and opinions about veganism and plant-based eating. Soon there'll be a tipping point where we go from a meat eating society or culture to maybe plant based. How long do you think that will be? Do you think it'll be in our lifetime? Do you think it will ever happen? I would never say it's nev never going to happen. I mean, I think I brought up when I was talking to you before that in 1948, it seemed impossible that a polio vaccine would ever happen. What happened a few years later? So, I mean, <laughs> I would never say it will never happen. It's going to be difficult, but there are so many solutions around this. I mean, as I, I've mentioned before, cultured meat, lab cultured meat is also a solution. I mean, we, we don't know what the ramifications of that will be, but it certainly seems to be a, a, a way we could go to reduce the impact of industrial farming significantly. But I think a lot of it is, it always comes down to the deprogramming that what we think is an axiom in our culture really isn't. It's just what basically the culture's, pro it's basically your programming. It's your operating system. And so we have to approach it though. I don't think we can, scream from the rooftops very effectively and say, this has to be done. This has to be done. You people are evil for doing what you're doing. And I think we have to really consider how we market it. And some people have done a great job, but I think some people have been a little lacking in that where they, they uh, 
get blinded by the other per or they're blinded to the other person's perspective. And because the, the best way you're going to convince somebody of something is if you think you make them think that they convince themselves. And one of the thoughts that's been running through this entire summit is that you have to treat people with kindness to get the message across. If you had one tip for people thinking about going plant-based, thinking about going vegan, either for the environment or their own health or for animal welfare, what would it be? Well, first off, don't be an extremist about it. You know, we have a, it's like when you meet some, uh, a born again Christian and sometimes they're the most extremist rather than somebody who's been Christian their whole life. You know, don't, you're just going to push people away from it. And also keep, remember, this is a personal journey first. And if you go to a place like Niger and start lecturing people on how they should eat and their practices, they're going to look at you like you're crazy. And also they're going to go, well, look at this person with his first world problems. You know, we, we struggle just to eat every day. <laughs> and he's telling us that we shouldn't be eating that one. He's just going to go to the Whole Foods and get what he needs. And we don't have that. Well, also, I think you know, an even more important tip is that there's so much good food that you don't require meat. That's all programming. I mean... You're, you're more likely, or at least for me, I've come to absolutely love cooking and just the, to strategize cooking and what I'm going to need, you know, because the one thing, it is a little more hard to work in one way to, you know, it's, am I getting enough protein? How am I going to get a omega-3? You've got to really consider things like that more, but that's what you should be doing anyway, instead of just throwing food in your body. And then hoping that these mRNA vaccines or this mRNA technology will be good against cancer in 20 years or 10 years. I mean, that's just, that's crazy. I think that one thing is that the big advantage you get from this path is you're much more likely going to be aware of what you're putting in your, your body. And that is a huge gift to give to yourself. Obviously, you have felt some health benefits attached to becoming vegan and vegetarian. What were they? Uh, fewer weight fluctuations. Because uh, my back issues are going to be beyond what I eat anyway. And in the past, I would have had a much larger weight fluctuation. But here, I've, I've stayed fairly co constant. Gain a few pounds here, lose a few pounds there. But it hasn't had that much of an impact, which is very good because the more weight I have, the more my, my neck and back are going to be a problem. So just that aspect, the, 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 the lack of weight fluctuation is huge, especially when you get into your forties and this, this lifestyle, I don't know if that would have been possible without this lifestyle. I mean, it, pro it, it probably would have been, but if I just went about how I was doing things before, no. Now I also find that a lot more goes with the veganism. I, I keep track of how many calories I put in just automatically. I pretty much memorized how many, cal you know, the calorie intake of everything I eat and what's coming in and what's going out with, with walking and all sorts of exercising. And that was the whole package I got. I, I can't speak for other people, but it was a lot more. It was, I don't, I don't want to say a complete lifestyle change, but it was, it was a massive change in my life and that goes way beyond just what I decided to eat. You know, that if there's a revolution going to happen, we really need to figure out how to market it and to market it in a, a very kind way, in a way that doesn't seem intrusive. And like we, we had a project where we were trying to get evangelicals to reach out to Muslims in the U.S. And what we did is we, we used an evangelical and he didn't preach to anybody. He just was saying basically his own experience and why he 
why he got converted into believing that Muslims were his brothers and sisters and that pathway. And the idea was, as I said earlier, is that you work to get the people to convince themselves that maybe this is the course they want to take. And so we have to, instead of talking at them, to talk with them and just outline the benefits without fear mongering. I think that we, we need to protect ourselves by not fear mongering. We also need to protect ourselves by not going down these misinformation rabbit holes, which I think has been, particularly in the last couple of years, has been a massive problem. And for one, you leave yourself open to, you basically destroy your own credibility by doing that, even though the movement has a lot of credibility. But if you destroy your credibility, you're going to destroy the movement's credibility. So what can we do to fight back against the big industries that control what we eat and what we do and the environmental impact? Basically, what you could do about these lobbies. And for one, to give an example, uh, we had a number of propositions over the last couple of years where, you know, California has a direct voting on propositions. And one of them was regarding water use. And you look at it on the surface and you're, oh, that sounds good. But then you look at who's funding or who's behind it. And you see like the name Resnick, the big almond magnet. And you go, wait a minute, wait a minute. Then you look a little deeper into it and you go, oh, yeah, uh, this is not good. And my point being that one of the defenses we have is knowledge. For one, uh, when it comes to propositions, who's behind the bill? And especially for water, because water is the most massive issue for California, uh, that it becomes very important to know these, these, who these people are. You give a face to these people, uh, you can change the game a little bit. You know their background, you know what their plans are, what they want. But it, you always have to start from setting an example yourself and what your action is. And which, which means starting small, but that's also, I refuse to say do your own research because that's been used so badly during this age of misinformation. But it is important to, to know your surroundings and what's going on in your local environment first and foremost. And that means being an informed voter. That means making informed decisions about what you're going to eat and the environmental impact it has on your local environment, first and foremost. And then you look deeper into it and you realize, oh, okay, well, that's having a big massive impact in Brazil or, or, or West Africa. So, but it always, you know, you have to, for every journey, it's taking the first step forward. And I think with regards to dealing with this powerful uh, lobbying machine is first off, you, you need to know who the names are. You need, you need to know what they're doing and where they stand on issues. And I think that's where you start is the, the having knowledge of your local environment, having knowledge of, of the big players in your environment. And which is something actually before 2017, I didn't pay that much attention to my local. I, I didn't care that much, to be honest. I didn't really think much about what was happening in my local environment. But that's where the citizen has the most power, right? <laughs> and that can, that can be the beginning of a much bigger movement. And even if it isn't, you are making... Uh, an impact. It might be a very small impact, but at least you're not making a massive footprint. At least you're doing your part to protect the ecosystem around you. And I mean, if, if that's the worst thing that happens, it's still worth it. So to summarize, major impact comes from one person taking action one step at a time. 
Yeah, even if it seems pointless and even if it seems like a futile lost cause, that's where it starts. I mean, because it, it only appears impossible. I, I, I really think that too. That I, and often on the verge of big change is when it appears just absolutely immovable. But then what you can do is, you know, be the guy that just keeps on pushing against the, the boulder. And just, you know, it, for one, it's something to do. You're going to have local benefits like your own health. You'll probably feel better about yourself that you're concerned about the footprint you leave behind. And is that a bad thing? No. And a greater sense of purpose. A greater sense of, but also a greater connection to the larger community, which includes every living thing on the planet. You know, that I think that that automatically comes with that, where you, you have a concern about industrial farming, not only for the environmental impact it has, but uh, also the ethical considerations of you're dealing with living beings and to have zero respect for them. I also, you know, that's the, that's the gateway drug into having zero respect for human life. Well, Matt, it's been amazing talking to you today. Thank you for taking part in this vegan plant-based summit. It's been an absolute pleasure and good luck with your filmmaking. Oh, thanks. And thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. Thank you.